Our next speaker is the geophysicist gone CCS architect. Rune Torsen joined Statoil in 2009 to change the world through CCS and thus consider himself a CCS teenager. With a subsurface background, he spent several years maturing CO2 storage sites in Norway and abroad before moving into the business development sites of CCS in 2020 through Equinor Global CCS Solutions. His present focus is designing the future CO2 transport and storage networks in the North Sea. We have invited Rune to tell the Equinor CCS story from Sleipner in 1996 to Northern Lights and beyond. The stage is yours, Rune. Thank you, Ivan, and thank you, Bellona, for having me here to present an, a storage operator's view of CCS. I think I will put this here as it's sliding, perhaps. So, a CCS teenager. I think Eva might consider herself a grown-up then. Um, but to me, having been through CCS for 13 years, I'm starting to compare CCS and my CCS life to running. And I think some of you might relate to this after the New Year's with the, your New Year's resolutions. But when I joined CCS, in 2009, we thought that CCS and CCS projects would be a quick sprint to the finish line. Only to realize that someone kept on moving the finish line, just as we thought we would get there. And we had the finish line in sight, and it kept on being moving. And it was being transformed and gradually into a mid and then long distance running. And these days, I think we are on the final stretch of what has become a CCS marathon. But we are getting close to the finish line, and I just hope that someone are not moving the finish line again. And I would try to eye the, uh, the state secretary who's coming up after me, but I cannot see him, so he might be digitally here, but uh, please do not move the finish line. Okay. And as Eva said, we often hear that CCS is expensive, it's complicated, it's uh, technically challenging, and, uh, and hard to do. So I wanted to bring up this newspaper article from the local newspaper here in Stavanger. This was written in 1996, and it's about the Sleipner project. And it quite simply explains that it's not that complicated. This was for the gas production for the CO2, and it says at the end, you cannot read it, but uh, I'll read it for you. We are essentially putting it back where we found it, putting it back down into the ground. So CCS does not have to be complicated. And the Sleipner project was really what kick-started it all for Statoil and later Equinor. It was our CCS qualifier. We have used it to verify the technology, gained a lot of experience in, uh, in the seismic uh, monitoring, showing that you can, we can see the CO2 in the subsurface, we can model it, we can simulate, so we know where the CO2 is going. And since the Sleipner project, we have also gained a lot of experience from the Snurvi project, the Insala project, so that we know how to inject in different types of wash environments, different types of reservoirs. So lots of knowledge has been gained. I'd also like to mention the uh, Mongstar project which I would call the Monster success story, even though uh, we often see that it's been uh, called a failure. But Monster gave us TCM, and TCM has given us so much information, so much knowledge, so much qualification of CO2 capture technology, given us technol technological advice, showing us how to do this. And I think Mohammed Shah is probably here today and he's going to present after lunch and give you more about the latest and greatest from TCM. But I think it's important to remember that we did not land on the moon with Apollo 1. But we will get there. So then to bring up our Apollo 11, our space shuttle, the Northern Lights project. I think everyone here today knows about this project, the Longship and Northern Lights. We're here today to discuss the way forward after this. But I think Northern Lights and Longship is looking to become a fantastic project. The decision to go forward here has really sparked interest all over the world. And the Northern Lights has more than 50 
potential customers lined up. We also saw the proof in the pudding, maybe the Christmas pudding before Christmas, when the EU Innovation Fund decided to go or give funding for four CCS projects, all four pointing to Northern Lights for their transportation and storage solution. So this is really, really good, really important. And we see on the image here that it is being built. The construction is ongoing in Eigaren, started building the ships to transport the CO2. So this is really happening. But for us in Equinor, we are not happy and not content with crossing the finish line with Northern Lights alone. We want more and we want to go further. Which is why in June last year, we came up with an updated strategy for CCS and low carbon and hydrogen. And if you see on the bottom left here, our updated ambition is 15 to 30 million tonnes CO2 equity share by 2035. In Northern Lights Phase 1, which is 1.5 million tonne, Equinor's share is half a million tonne. So to go up to 30 million tonne equity is a 60-fold increase. So really, really ambitious targets. We also say that we would like to take more than 25% of the European transportation and storage market of CO2 sorry, of CO2 by 2035. So I think we are speeding up. Even though it's been a long run, we still have a lot of stamina and strength left to really go the distance. And I'd also like to mention that three months ago, Equinor launched the Norway Energy Hub, which is a grand scale initiative of how to transform the Norwegian industry and Norway as a sustainable energy provider. And within that plan, which in also includes a lot of increase in hydrogen production, offshore wind, we also have a big chunk of CO2 storage. And we've said that we can potentially store as much as 40 million tons of CO2 every year in Norway by 2035. And we will not do that alone. We will do it with partners. Equinor will take a big share but we also need others, other parts of the industry to step up and deliver on this. And we think it's possible. Um, I've put up here up to 100 million tonnes because we look beyond 2035. We look to 2040 and 2050 and what do we need to do? And to be able to get there, I think we need to work together. I think we need to have the state also really start pushing. I think they're doing a great job because we need long-term and predictable frame conditions. We need to have funding available for different parts of projects that are on different uh, parts of the maturity chain. We need help to build the market. We need to have EU be able to receive our services. So we need bilateral agreements, like we've seen between Norway and the UK. We've heard that Norway has also gone into bilateral agreements with the Netherlands, and we're working with other countries as well. So we really need to see that moving on. For the Nordic countries, of course, we would like to see the Nordic countries be uh, ambitious enough to be the world's most uh, a low carbon area, really high focus on bioenergy CCS, lots of potential in Sweden and Denmark for capture, sorry, Sweden and Finland for capture. Storage can be done in Denmark and Norway. And the bottom one is the one that's closest to my heart. Um, and my background as a geophysicist, we really need to incentivize the maturation of new storage capacity. We need more licenses. Just referring to the 40 million ton stored in Norway by 2035, we said that we need 10 to 15 new storage licenses. And we would like that to happen through open CCS license rounds, similar to what we have in the APA rounds in petroleum today, and different to the one-by-one one nomination, as we see uh, so far. We need to have open license rounds to deliver more licenses and to be able to take a portfolio approach to de-risking the large-scale infrastructure that we really need to build to get down the unit cost of CO2. And I'd also like to see CCS data acquisition incentivized, because we are working in a low-income environment in a high-cost environment because we are working in the, in the petroleum business. Petroleum costs are high, CCS income is low, 
So that is something that needs to be looked at. There are some things that can be done through Climit, and we have some great uh, experience there. But when you come to do data acquisitions instead of just desktop studies, the costs are high, and the Climit needs more money to be able to fund that. So just to finish off, I think we are in a really good position. I think we are mutually dependent on each other. Everyone in this room, everyone in the industry, we as an industry need to do our part to cut costs, develop new technology, move forward. But we need the state and the regulators also to do their part to have uh, flexible and, uh, and good frame conditions. And we cannot do it single-handedly in silos. We need to do it together as partners, and then we can succeed. So with that, I would say thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day.